Good morning, everyone. I would like, uh, first of all, to um, thank uh, the organizers, in particular Jack, for uh, this great opportunity of being here today and uh, share with you um, what I think is a wonderful uh, job that uh, I'm so lucky to have. And this is about uh, working at CERN. So, um, in particular, yes. Um, I'm going to cover uh, the challenges in computing uh, which uh, happen at CERN, and uh, as Jack was saying, uh, in uh, an environment of uh, a very large and complex uh, uh, apparatus such as uh, the Large Hadron Collider, um, looking at uh, what happens today, but also having uh, uh, later on, towards the end of my talk, uh, a, 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 a look also what uh, um, will happen in uh, the future in the next uh, 10 years from now. So um, as I'm working at CERN, let me start with uh, the mission of CERN. CERN is a fairly large uh, organization and uh, in particular uh, uh, really um, has got uh, a very, very unique set of uh, accelerator facilities which allow us uh, uh, to answer some of the fundamental questions about uh, the origin of uh, the universe. Um, together with this comes also the capability of uh, handling uh, very, very advanced technologies, in particular in the areas of uh, uh, detectors and accelerators, but not only. CERN is also known to be a, a leading uh, um, um, res research environment for uh, computing, and uh, actually, there's much more than particle physics at CERN. There's a lot of spin-off applications, which uh, I will cover in a second, uh, which are, and have been important uh, uh, for all of us. An important aspect, uh, of course, of a large laboratory like CERN is the ability to train uh, scientists and engineers for tomorrow. Some of those will stay with us, some other people will uh, work uh, somewhere else. We have a very high rate uh, of uh, success uh, um, of uh, having students uh, in information technologies then moving uh, to industry. But what really makes CERN special, and I'm very proud of this aspect in particular, is the fact that it's really a worldwide laboratory. And we have uh, really all cultures, people from all, all over the world, welcome the CERN to work uh, all together under uh, the purpose of uh, research and the science. Now, as you can see from uh, uh, this uh, map, actually this is really a worldwide endeavor. We have a lot uh, of uh, um, countries participating into the CERN program at uh, different levels of responsibilities. CERN was funded by 12 European states just after the war, the Second World War, and it was uh, funded as a laboratory for peace, really responding to uh, the events uh, of the Second World War. Today, uh, something like 18,000 people basically work at CERN. If you count from the staff members like me, uh, to uh, other kinds of uh, um, uh, pay paid personnel, um, typically students. We have about 2,000 students. But then what really makes uh, CERN so big is the contribution from uh, the uh, scientific uh, users, which are coming, as I said, from basically many, many countries uh, around the world. We have a budget of about one billion per year. And with this, uh, we actually uh, use all our uh, uh, knowledge in order to answer uh, throughout uh, uh, experiments uh, the fundamental questions about how matter is uh, um, composed of, what are the fundamental forces, how particles, fundamental particles interact with uh, each other. Basically, uh, uh, really uh, trying to reproduce with the accelerators uh, the first instance of the universe birth with the link that uh, is very well known uh, between the infinitely small particle physics and the infinitely large, which is the scale of cosmology. 
is really fascinating, but it's not only that. As I said, there's also a very important program towards innovation and uh, leading edge technology. And in particular, we really have a kind of a three pillars here. Um, we have a, a very deep knowledge about accelerating particle uh, technologies. Um, about uh, how to detect particles and all the technologies which are behind the uh, complex apparatus like the four experiments at the LHC. But very importantly, the glue of this is also a, a very, very good team which is handling uh, the challenges in computing, which is the focus of my talk. Um, I just want to mention, because uh, uh, I think it's very important for a laboratory like CERN to be able also to talk about spin-off, all the knowledge about accelerator uh, technologies has resulted in uh, improvements at the level of um, uh, the um, uh, uh, machines uh, which perform, for instance, hadron therapy, as well as uh, uh, the um, um, all of the uh, research which is uh, devoted into uh, advancements in uh, uh, detection of uh, particles has been fundamental for some uh, um, uh, research around imaging for, for instance, uh, uh, brain uh, uh, tumor. So uh, a laboratory like CERN is also able to give uh, uh, big insights about things which matter to all of us, like research in medicine. Now, um, everybody has uh, been familiar, I guess, uh, with the uh, uh, discoveries of the, uh, one of the um, missing uh, particles uh, uh, as we were uh, uh, looking for it for many years, which is the Higgs boson. This discovery has come with the uh, LHC, actually. Um, and there's been a fundamental uh, discovery for our sector, but in its uh, 60 years of life, CERN has made uh, many other discoveries, has discovered, for instance, the carrier of the weak force, the WNZ boson, has uh, confirmed uh, that the number of neutrino families is three with uh, the uh, previous uh, machine, uh, um, which was also installed in the current tal tunnel where the LHC is and uh, also has participated into something that maybe not everybody know, uh, know about. CERN is actually the place where the web was, uh, uh, was, uh, um, ca came as an idea. Um, uh, Tim Berners-Lee was working at CERN, and this is actually his first proposal for a new idea that he had about the information management, a new information management technology that he proposed to his boss, and his boss rated it as vague but exciting, which means that really sometimes we do not know, we, we cannot really understand the power of what will come in the future. Um, but it's clearly one of the examples uh, that we are proud of for a disruptive uh, technology, which affects all of us. Now, moving uh, to the bulk of my talk, um, actually, uh, this is an aerial view of, uh, of, uh, of a CERN, uh, the CERN area and uh, the laboratory. Um, so uh, the, uh, really the, the site where uh, physicists stay is around uh, uh, this part of, the, um, of this view. Um, there's a set of accelerators which uh, um, serve as injectors to the uh, Large Hadron Collider. It is uh, in a, in a tunnel of uh, about 27 uh, circumference um, underground. Uh, between 50 to 170 uh, meters. There are uh, four uh, detectors around it, uh, which uh, you can see here, ALICE, uh, ATLAS, LHCB, and CMS. And the trillions of particles are basically traveling almost at the speed of light, uh, making uh, uh, more than 11,000 turns uh, every second. Now, <coughs> In comparison, if you like, uh, uh, here there are the pre-alps, and uh, in some view you would be uh, seeing the Mont Blanc. So it's a very, very beautiful area with a lot of uh, challenges for uh, skiers. 
Um, and uh, you can see here actually the uh, airport of uh, Geneva compared to the 27 kilometer of the LHC ring. Just to give you a, a size, an, a, an idea of the size. Now, the LHC comes with a lot of uh, interesting and exciting features. Uh, uh, we can certainly call it the fastest uh, racetrack on the planet, but we can also say that it's the coolest place where uh, on Earth when one can work because the 1,200 magnets, superconducting magnets, are really kept almost at the absolute zero in order to be operating. We are just 1.9 degrees above the absolute zero. So it's one of the coldest places of uh, the universe, as far as we know. And uh, uh, four very, very sophisticated uh, machines, enormous machines, are used in order to detect the infinitely small. Also, with the, when the beams collide, lots of energy is produced. And if you compare this energy uh, with the temperatures in the heart of the sun, we are basically above those but in very, very tiny spots. <clears throat> uh, a view of the um, LHC basically is a series of uh, uh, magnets in a tunnel with uh, arcs and straight sections where the um, detectors are. And uh, uh, these are beautiful uh, uh, detectors. ATLAS and the CMS are the so-called general purpose experiments. This is where the Higgs boson has been found, for instance. Um, they are collaborations of about 4,000 physicists, so it's really uh, also challenging uh, to work in a collaboration like this, and they've been uh, uh, up to two years ago competing coordinator of the CMS experiment. And uh, from a social viewpoint, it's very interesting to uh, to be uh, working in a, such a big collaboration. There are also two other experiments uh, which are uh, uh, targeted to special kind of physics. LHCB is there to answer about uh, our quest of why uh, there is so much matter and so little antimatter in the world. And the Alice experiment is there to, start, to study the so-called so quark gluon plasma, which is uh, um, believed to be a state of matter in the very early uh, um, stages of the universe formation. And basically, will give answers of why the quarks and the gluons bond so much to form uh, particles like the protons and, generally speaking, the hadrons. If you're wondering uh, how actually after a proton-proton collision, or in the case of Alice, a lead-lead collision looks like, uh, this is uh, a snapshot of an event at the LHC. Charged uh, particles leave dots into uh, very, very uh, precise and sophisticated uh, uh, detectors. And you can then reconstruct their uh, uh, going through the matter. And uh, those in green are basically the deposits of uh, the energy of uh, the particles which are formed from the collisions. What is very important, I'll come to that later, is the fact that uh, although we generate a lot of data and the detectors actually are <coughs> at each collision, uh, generating a lot of uh, uh, data that uh, can potentially be read out. We do not uh, uh, collect everything. It would be impossible because it would go at the level of petabytes per second. And actually, not all what is produced by the machine is interesting. And in the end, it turns out that only one uh, in a million of a collision is actually of interest and gets recorded. Now, there are a lot of challenges, therefore, because of uh, all I said and the rate in which we need to suppress uh, the data from when it is produced. There's a lot of challenges in the way we do data handling at, uh, um, and data processing at the LHC. And the first challenge starts really with the so-called triggers that are a set of either hardware cuts or software triggers 
which allow us to make choices. So out of the 40 million collisions per second that the LHC produces, which as I said, produce a kind of amount of data of the order of a petabyte per second, we will have to make choices, and we are guided by uh, electronics, but we're also guided by software choices in order to decide what we keep. What we throw, we throw. We will never look at it. So if we are making a mistake there, we are missing an opportunity. So we really need to be sure that we know what we're doing. Um, when we write data, uh, the so-called raw data, which is really the hits of the electronics, which have been left by the passage of the particles in the detectors, we get to something like a thousand uh, collisions per second. This is really what each experiment records. So this happens basically with the decisions we say in real time. This is the order of the milliseconds, uh, so from microseconds decision to milliseconds in the end. And this is really an area that for the future we will be looking at more carefully to see whether with new and more recent techniques we can change some of our classic paradigms of doing the so-called triggers. What comes after? is the responsibility of the so-called offline. So is asynchronous, asynchronous and has all to deal with basically taking the raw data and uh, um, understanding and reconstruct um, second by second, event by event, what has really happened. So we have a series of steps which we do in the so-called <coughs> Worldwide LHC computing grid, WLCG. And these have to do with the reconstruction. Input to reconstruction is basically the conditions in which the detector was at the time in which such an event was happening, which are then fed as input to the reconstruction. We then compare what we have seen, what we have observed at the machine, with what we believe is the model of our theories. And then this results into comparisons between the real data and the so-called expected background, out of which we uh, calculate relevant quantities and we are able to uh, produce um, discoveries or make precision measurements. Now, <coughs> all this basically brings us to uh, um, a selection uh, which out of 150 million sensors of, uh, that each of the four detectors uh, gives in terms of uh, um, recorded, uh, potentially recorded data, 40, time millions, uh, 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 40 million times per second, which is the rate at which uh, <coughs> sorry, particles collide at the LHC. We then have two types of data, as I just said, the so-called raw data, which really contains the electronics, um, where a certain element of each of these 100 million sensors have been hit by a particle, how much energy was deposited or was contained by each particle, when this happened. Two, uh, given the input on, uh, on, uh, on um, the state of the detectors, the so-called reconstructed data, which is the base of our analysis. And this contains really the, uh, <coughs> the elements of uh, the information that the physicists need, which is uh, what was the momentum of these uh, uh, tracks, uh, what was the energy, <coughs> what kind of particle, was really there, and so on. So you can see here in a schematic, uh, out of uh, uh, each of the uh, collisions, um, electronics signals are then recorded. Um, and the triggers and the data acquisition filters allow us to make a very tough decision of the order of uh, a factor of a million, throw what we believe is not interesting, 
and get back to what we believe is a potential interesting for physics or even for new physics, like it was in the case of the Higgs boson discovery. So we are really making a, a, a very, very big uh, a step in terms of selection and data mining here of orders of magnitude. And uh, a rate of one gigabyte a second of raw data is then sent, sent to the CERN data center. Each of the four experiments do, of course, the same simultaneously, many times a second. So we end up with something like four gigabytes a second. Here I'm displaying the nominal values which the four LHC experiments at the start of the LHC declared they would be taking data. And in the blue is what actually is nowadays in 2017. And no, no surprise is much more than they thought uh, would be happening. Now, uh, all the data is then stored in the computer center, which then is responsible uh, for the primary storage of this data, but also for the distribution. Across uh, um, something which, as I said, is called the grid. Now, just a couple of insights about the size of the computer center at CERN. First of all, I, I would like to point to the fact that we actually have two computer centers, one in Geneva, and the other one is in Hungary, in Budapest. We have two physical centers, but we treat them as a logical unit. So we don't see the difference of what happens. We have a very, very good connection in terms of 100 of gigabit per second fibers across the two centers, and we manage to treat them as a unit. Now we have something like, uh, uh, between the two centers, uh, we have something like, uh, currently 300,000 cores, and we store something like 250 petabytes of primary data. This is just showing the traffic between the two centers uh, to say that, yeah, it's true. We do operate them together. And after this, we basically have the capabilities of the so-called first layer of the so-called the, the grid is the tier zero, which is the CERN tier zero, the CERN computer center. Um, it does uh, have the responsibility, of course, of recording the data, but also of the first pass reconstruction and the distribution out to 13 main centers around the world, which are so-called the so-called tier one centers. They have also a very large responsibility. They are responsible for the second copy of our primary raw data, but also they are uh, um, there for doing further reconstruction as long as we have more information about the so-called calibration data we perform during the year, other passes of the reconstruction. And <coughs> they're also responsible for basically sending this data out to the other centers around the world, which are the tier twos, which deal with more of the generation of the Monte Carlo data, the comparisons from the theory, and of course, the end user analysis. In total, we have something like 170 centers participating to the grid. Um, 42 countries are involved in this project. We have about uh, a million cores. We have about an exadata of, uh, exadata of storage. Uh, we have a remarkable amount of uh, two million jobs per day in order to process, analyze, reconstruct this data. Among these centers, there are uh, gigabit per second leaks, which go uh, between 10 to 100. But what is really remarkable success of the grid is actually that it really uh, happens to be behaving like a unit. So when you're using it as a user, you don't know where your job is running. You will only know the result. And this is really a remarkable, uh, if you like, achievement of uh, our uh, capabilities uh, uh, in, uh, in the uh, research in computing at the LHC to have built something that is uh, uh, 170 centers behaving like a single unit, a single infrastructure, which is accessible by all researchers. For this, a very important part is, of course, the capabilities which are given by the uh, 
networks. We clearly had special fibers which allowed us from CERN to go to these uh, tier one centers. Today we have something uh, of the order of 100 uh, gigabit uh, per second links, but we started with uh, uh, something of the order of uh, one uh, and then upgraded to 10 later. Today we have an infrastructure which allows us uh, uh, to uh, basically distribute data over the transatlantic uh, um, links up to more than 300 gigabit per second. So we are not far from the one terabit per second scale, which is also a remarkable achievement and is important for the future. And if you want a screenshot of uh, the uh, kind of uh, worldwide effort that the grid has brought us, uh, uh, this is actually it. This is the total amount of sites which participate into this single WCG infrastructure. So it's really a remarkable uh, achievement together with the many others that I just dis discussed. Now, in summary, what is the scale of the current problem? Out of, of the one petabyte second of data which is generated by the detectors, something like uh, 60 petabytes per year of primary data gets stored by the four experiments together, at least currently. Last year we did a record of 70 petabytes a year. We have a distributed computing infrastructure which contains basically of the order of a million cores working of 24 by seven, uh, which would place us if it would be displayed uh, uh, um, centrally uh, among uh, the top supercomputers in the world. We have an average of uh, 60 million jobs per month, uh, and we have a remarkable continuous rate of data transfers of about uh, 35 gi uh, gigabytes per second, which ends up to something like a three petabyte per day. And this is really unique in, uh, in the world. There's no other uh, um, projects or companies um, which actually do so much data distribution as we do. <clears throat> um, all this translated into plots because we are physicists, just the same thing as I showed you, uh, proves that uh, what I'm talking about is <clears throat> really true. The one million core which uh, has been uh, achieved recently, uh, uh, the um, <clears throat> more than 200 petabytes on tape, because we also record, as I said, uh, data for archival at CERN and at one of the 13 tier ones around the world. There is also a tape copy of this and the data movements of uh, uh, three petabytes a day. What do we do with all this data? And this comes uh, the uh, um, third part of my talk, which is uh, the data mining problem at the LHC. Uh, we like to say that what we do is uh, uh, to find a needle in a haystack, and it's really true, because uh, out of the uh, 40 uh, million uh, collisions per second that are produced when the two bunches into the LHC cross, we actually have a very suppressed rate of the so-called new particle production, whether we're looking for an X particle or an X boson, or whether we're looking for new physics, this is the kind of rate that we have to deal. So we have to be able to find algorithms that allow us to select one event in 10 trillions. And we need a lot of data then to produce uh, uh, and to make sure that we have a discovery for new physics. So this is why the LHC discovery didn't come on the first year, but came on the third year of the run of the, um, uh, the LHC. And this is why precision measurements are coming only now, when the data statistics is increasing. So out of one of these 10, tri uh, 10 trillions, I went to look, and it's like finding that grain of sand into to any volleyball course is an analogy. Uh, it's not scientific, but it's remarkable to understand how difficult it is to make a selection for physics at the LHC. Now, um, this is a summary slide 
of uh, what I just said from uh, um, producing the data at the LHC um, up to the final selection, which is used by the analysis scientists all over the world, we have a series of steps. On the top is uh, the uh, kind of uh, rates at which the data needs to be processed, uh, expressed in uh, um, volume of data per second. And at the bottom is the kind of uh, uh, infrastructure that is needed to, to perform each of the steps and the kind of people, experts, that are involved at each step. So you can see is a remarkable amount of uh, uh, sequences of steps, which brings us from, product, from, uh, um, uh, from the uh, collision so produced at the LHC to the end. Uh, they involve uh, uh, several uh, uh, thousands of cores, each of those steps. Some steps are re repeated. So we end up with uh, having uh, derived the data multiple times if we needed to do, for instance, multiple reconstructions during the year as the uh, calibrations constants have been refined. And we really end up in, uh, in having uh, basically the uh, um, scale of the uh, exa uh, bytes. Now, <coughs> moving uh, on, I've been uh, basically covering what happened between uh, 2010, the first uh, uh, year of the operations of the LHC machine up to 2018, we are at the beginning year. And this, if you like, uh, is really the operation that is uh, uh, foreseen for the LHC to be running. So although we started eight years ago now, we are really at the very early stages of the exploitations of this machine, which will go until uh, 2035 and beyond. You can see here the kind of integrated luminosities, which gives you the amount of data that we have collected so far and what we need to do in the next years. And here you see the kind of uh, uh, so-called uh, instantaneous luminosity of the LHC. Now is operating uh, at the level of uh, 2, 10 to the um, 34 particles. It really gives you the amount of uh, particles per centimeter square and per second measurement. And it will go higher, much higher at the so-called high luminosity LHC, which will start in 2026. Another important feature of the LHC run is that it uh, starts uh, with the periods of three years. So we run typically for three years and then we stop. And these technical stops, which are marked there in gray, are the opportunities for us to really make uh, big changes uh, and repairs at the level of the detectors. So the detectors that I showed you the photos at the beginning get completely opened. There's a lot of repair, but it's also an opportunity uh, to make changes when it's needed. So for instance, what happens in 2000 and, uh, at the end of 2018 is called long shutdown two. And this is when Alice and LHCB, the two um, uh, of the four detectors, will be upgraded and uh, um, their detectors will be changed and the way in which they will be operated will change as well, bringing challenges in computing as well as in physics. And RAM4, and uh, previously the so-called long shutdown three, which will uh, happen at the end of 2023, will be a moment in which the two general purpose detectors, the big ones, Atlas and CMS, they are big uh, as uh, several stores uh, um, or buildings, they will be opened and changed and prepared for the high luminosity LHC, which is really a new regime at which the machine will be operated. Moreover, to make it more complicated, the trigger rates, you remember I told you about the fact that we record 1,000 uh, uh, collisions per second? Well, at the high luminosity LHC, this will go a factor 10 above. So they're talking about uh, a minimum uh, 7.5 kilohertz 
um, if no more, so we will have uh, the, the experiments having to accept 10 times more data. And this uh, means that uh, uh, actually we need to prepare for this because we will have many more challenges in the future and we are expecting many more, uh, much more data than what we can, what we are recording today. And I will cover in a second uh, why. Now, so this period that is from this year onwards is preparing for the long shutdown too. And this is an opportunity when we are not taking data to make changes, to try things, and to probably propose new uh, projects and new ways of doing things. And this is why I have been highlighting this, because this is really where uh, um, our collaborations, uh, um, our researchers, Industry works together with us in order to try new things. Now, if you're wondering, uh, in a program which is lasting from 2010 to 2035, is this, uh, uh, you know, this is really 20 years of life, but how long do we plan for this? Well, the answer is uh, we plan for a lot of time in advance for new things. So today, <coughs> We are uh, really uh, uh, basically doing physics at the LHC, but the first design has been happening in, 2000, in, uh, in 1985. So it's really a lifetime of several decades in order to perform a full project in high energy physics. The high luminosity LHC, very similar situation. We have been starting to talk about the upgrade of the LHC as of 2005, uh, basically when the machine was just starting to be operated, and we will go into physics in uh, 2026 or 27. So it's really <clears throat> a long time in which uh, a, an experiment in high energy physics uh, stays, which means that we have, of course, planned for it. We have our software. Many of the choices that we have made have to last and be maintained for many years, which is one of the challenges also in computing in the end. I just want to give uh, some insights about our future program. I profit of this slide. We might, we are looking now at the new generation of colliders. If you're wondering, this is the LHC, is already very big. We are talking about possibly building in, uh, with the construction phase which would start uh, when the uh, high luminosity LHC will start operating, so 2025, a new collider. It will be going, uh, it will be sitting between the Jura and the Prealps, going below the Lake of Geneva. Having the LHC as an injector is a project of something like 80 to 100 kilometers tunnel. Um, and I would be <laughs> very much happy to see it uh, happening. But it's a, a long, uh, you know, a really long in the future. And up here is the set of uh, accelerators. The last one is the one that I'm concentrating on today, is the LHC. But you can see it's served by a series of accelerators which uh, are injectors to, to it. And each of them actually has got its own program of physics. So what we do at CERN in particle physics is not only at the LHC. The LHC is our flagship, but we do a lot more. And it's important also to mention the other experiments. So moving back to our challenges for the future, I said we are looking into this and we are thrilled by uh, the challenges. Why is that? Because we have run some simulations and we have understood that the amount of data that we need to store and the CPU needs, so the computing capacity that will need to be handled, having much higher uh, factors of uh, data uh, coming into play is of the order 60 to 100. <coughs> and although in uh, eight to 10 years from now, we can believe again, technology will help us and will absorb some of these challenges per itself, uh, we are still uh, probably uh, having to handle a so-called resource gap of the order of a factor 10 with respect to what we can do today and actually what we can afford. Because it's very important to understand that in research, we normally uh, work as a, um, in a so-called 
um, constant uh, profile of budgets, so we are not going to get more money. We need to do things in a smarter way if we want to solve the challenges of the high luminosity LHC. Now, we clearly can count on the fact that we have had uh, a number of years now operating uh, the LHC, also the level of computing, but a factor 10 is not easy to be absorbed. It's really a lot, actually. And if you want to uh, know the kind of a complexity that we are going to face at the high luminosity LHC, this is a comparison with what we have today, which is already very, very complicated. It's a record event recorded the last year uh, by the CMS experiment with something like 78 uh, simultaneous events happening at the time in which the event that we wanted to record triggered our selections criteria. Uh, so we have a lot of background at the LHC, and, uh, which is already a remarkable, can I say, effort for our software. But what we are going to go is really much, much higher. And there will be a lot of, if you like, noise, other and interesting events, we call them pile up, uh, on what we would like to trigger and it will be the event that we will want to record. So we really don't have to make this wrong. And uh, as CERN is uh, facing this uh, resource uh, um, gap of a factor 10, it will be very unlikely that we are able to close this uh, uh, factor 10 in a single or with a single revolutionary change. Might come, but uh, we uh, really believe that we have to work in many areas and again a factor two here and there in order to be able to uh, face uh, the amount of data uh, that is coming with the high luminosity LHC. So we'll not be coming from a place only. And this is why we have started R&D work. So research and development in a many, many uh, different areas from infrastructure to improvements in software, exploitation of artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques, and of course, with a very close look at the hardware evolution. And the last part of my talk is going really to cover these challenges briefly. Um, I would like to mention the opportunity that we have at the uh, at CERN to work together with industry. This is really the bulk of what I do today. Uh, as a, a CERN Open Lab CTO. And this is a snapshot of the partners and the members of our collaboration. We really work with the leading, um, uh, uh, leading companies in uh, the sectors of uh, processing, uh, databases, uh, storage, clouds, with many uh, research partners that uh, together with us uh, share the challenges in uh, uh, high energy physics and beyond high energy physics. Um, I'm leaving you a link of uh, a white paper uh, which has been uh, um, uh, a big uh, chunk of what I've been doing last year uh, in 2017, has been published three months ago, contains uh, a snapshot of all of the uh, R&D uh, areas that we are going to tackle in order to face the uh, challenges at the high luminosity LHC um, has been really written uh, thinking of uh, our uh, community and uh, um, our uh, uh, industry partners. And there's a lot of nice information in there. And there is a link on the slides which is available. Of course, areas where we are going to concentrate together with the industry are basically the same as I said before. Changes in data center technologies and infrastructures, of course, computing performance and software, and of course, the use of machine learning and data anal uh, analytics in order to do better what we have been doing until now in a very classic way, like triggers, data acquisition, data reconstruction, data processing. So. Um, the first uh, uh, R&D uh, that I want to share with you is about uh, the uh, um, adoption of uh, 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 clouds and in particular the capability of bursting out to uh, additional resources on demand. 
Um, CERN, as of uh, 2014, approximately, with the start of Run 2, has been already provisioning services uh, as a virtualized uh, uh, cloud. We are very early adopters and proud adopters of uh, uh, OpenStack, and we deliver our services since years now like this as a virtualized cloud environment. But um, here we also need to demonstrate as an experiment, for instance, that if we need more hardware, if we need more resources, we are actually capable of uh, bursting out and take an opportunity. Whether it's coming from uh, an academic cloud, or whether it's coming from a commercial uh, cloud, doesn't matter whether it's coming from HPC. We really need to make use of what is made available to us, especially if this is opportunistic resources for us. As, as I said, we don't have a, a, a lot of budget for increasing resources ourselves. So these two uh, graphs show actually uh, two uh, experiments uh, that we did with Google and with the, the Amazon Web Services, both successful. One is about uh, uh, simulation uh, data we have used to, with Google up to 300,000 cores, really bursting out to more than double of the entire capacity of the computing used by CMS. Uh, and this happened last year. And uh, um, at, at the beginning of the year as well, uh, we could double the capacity of the tier ones centers for doing uh, while here simulation. This was really reconstruction of data. So very two very uh, very uh, good uh, R and D uh, uh, projects which have demonstrated that we as a experiments and as a service provisions we are capable of uh, uh, using and adopting uh, uh, external uh, facilities like uh, um, public clouds. Moving on, same happens uh, for the HPC. In several countries, we have HPC infrastructure, which is made available also to research. Um, we have managed to make use of it, but we are really working uh, uh, even more at the level of our, our applications in order to make the needed modifications and really take the full advantage of uh, an HPC uh, resource. We are traditionally an HTC environment, high throughput computing, this is what we do. So uh, changing our algorithms in order to be fully exploiting HPC is something that we started working only a, a couple of years ago, and now we have a couple of successes. Um, another area that uh, uh, we are going to work on in order to close this gap is moving out of uh, uh, computing. Um, so we have talked about changes which will allow us to have more computing power. How about storage? Now, the way in which actually a job runs on the grid is that it's typically being to be launched by the user and will end up where the data is actually. And we'll use that data locally. 20 baht. At a certain point, we decided that we would also be doing uh, remote reading for our applications and uh, um, optimize at the level of the storage to avoid of having so many multiple copies of derived data all over the world. And we successfully put in place the so-called data federations for CMS and Atlas. And we showed that uh, with success, we can run at least 20% of our jobs reading data remotely. Now, this concept uh, translated into the future is basically looking at uh, the uh, capabilities which are given by our uh, centers. In particular, I'm talking here about the centers which host our data and uh, typically our large tier one centers and try basically to make an optimization at the level of um, the copies uh, that we are um, reproducing so at the moment basically in many, many centers. If we want to reduce this, we basically have to reduce uh, the, um, an aggregate in a sort of a concept of data lake also for high energy physics 
and have uh, basically storage provisioned by large a few centers, very well connected by uh, leaks of the order of one terabit per second. I told you we have already 300 terabit of uh, cross-Atlantic links, so this is not impossible to achieve. But basically here would be, we believe that aggregating the uh, storage uh, capabilities and having a few centers only as repositories of our data and be able to do more of the remote reading and also remote writing uh, once we have analyzed our data will help us in saving and closing the uh, gap at the level of the storage. So we have initiated a prototype on this and this is really at the very early phase of exploitation. We'll have a meeting in a couple of months and you will hear probably more about data lakes in uh, the future years. <coughs> The last couple of slides um, are about changing methods. The first one is about, of course, machine learning. Um, why uh, are we uh, looking at this? First of all, we are very familiar with the use of neural nets as a community. We have been using it in physics analysis for 20 years. We even ran a challenge uh, after the discovery of the Higgs boson, um, created a data set, opened it to the world for having the best kind of uh, uh, um, uh, deep learning techniques proposals from the community with a winner and so on. So we are very familiar with the use of neural nets in a physics analysis. But the modern machine learning techniques and in particular deep learning algorithms developed by industry actually are in, 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 in very, very interesting also for us. And uh, uh, the four experiments have been gathering together in, uh, um, in making R&D um, projects with the industry in this case. And this is where uh, CERN Open Lab is certainly working and helping uh, in the area of machine learning, trying to adopt deep learning, for instance, for change it with the way in which we do the triggers and do and try an experiment, real time event characterization using deep learning techniques. So using uh, semi-supervised or unsupervised learning. Use of uh, uh, 3D uh, uh, imaging, uh, computer vision, in particular in the areas of data reconstruction and data simulation. And there are many successes here that I'm listing I cannot cover them all, but you will find some of these into the white paper, and I can give you more reference later if you need. Up to the use of machine learning for things that uh, industry does very well, like uh, um, uh, predictive maintenance of uh, complex uh, uh, industrial apparata, can be a very, a very nice uh, use uh, for a complex apparatus like the ILHC or our detectors. And these are, uh, therefore, many areas where we are applying it up to the last one that is about uh, optimizing the way, for instance, we distribute data in a more intelligent way, not only with the concept of data lakes, but even a step further. So we are really looking at many uh, techniques here together with the industry in all the areas where we, uh, we do our uh, data processing chain. Last slide about software. Uh, well, uh, uh, the, uh, while the density of <coughs> transistor per, uh, per core is following uh, still more slow, certainly uh, this blue curve shows the plateau in terms of clock frequency as of 2005. This is when we have realized that uh, um, using uh, uh, and changing uh, our legacy code would have brought us uh, uh, gains uh, in, uh, in speed which were not coming anymore from the hardware. And there has been a lot of investments in the area of re-engineering and in the area of uh, um, high uh, uh, level of computing skills from the viewpoint of uh, programming, which, has, uh, which have been successful and we already gained uh, factor two, for instance, in speeding up our code using uh, modern, uh, more modern techniques. Now, this is clearly an area that we are looking at because having a factor two uh, or three 
uh, more uh, uh, um, improvements in, in software and going faster is really going uh, to help us in closing this uh, uh, resource gap, as I said. So, and potentially, as we have demonstrated here that we can do that, we are looking more and more in this. Of course, the investments are big, and we do not have uh, a very large community of big experts. Our researchers come, develop a part of code, they migrate, they, they, they do some other jobs later. So it's a, a challenge also from a viewpoint of uh, uh, you know, the social uh, uh, environment of an experiment in order to keep the right skills. Um, my last slide is about, of course, hardware evolution. I, we are looking also at uh, uh, different kind of uh, alternatives, use of accelerators and coprocessors in the areas of triggers, in the areas of uh, reconstruction in order to do uh, better and in a, a more efficient way what we have been doing until now. And in particular, we have been explore, uh, exploring the adoption of GPUs uh, for uh, uh, fast inference at the level of the triggers and uh, uh, training capabilities, as well as in simulation. Um, FPGAs uh, have been already adopted uh, since a few years in uh, triggers, but we are looking at uh, all of the uh, capabilities that are coming from accelerators in these areas. Uh, and I want to uh, mention also uh, the work that has been ongoing a year ago, importing all our uh, software uh, to alternative architectures like uh, ARM has been successful, and we hope to be doing more in this area of low cost and low power processors. So to conclude, um, the LHC uh, has been running since uh, 2010. We will uh, complete uh, very successful our uh, second run this year. The accelerator, but also the detectors and the computing systems have been working remarkably well. There have been discoveries, there have been a lot of precision measurements, there have been a lot of papers produced by the community. So I'm really proud of our uh, advancement in uh, this uh, uh, a flagship uh, project of uh, uh, CERN. Um, from the viewpoint of uh, computing, uh, the LHC uh, was born as a distributed uh, environment from the beginning, has been also very successfully running, and has showed the ability and the value uh, of supporting computing through many sites has been the right choice with uh, a lot of participation from uh, the entire community as a whole. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we are looking at the uh, new challenges ahead of us, which are coming from the high luminosity LHC. And as we are going to uh, be handling uh, something like a factor 100 more times in terms of computing needs, we are looking at this uh, together with industry and uh, together with the other sciences in order to face the challenges. Um, many thanks.